we don't not do some of the things that we know that the benefits far outweigh, that the pros far outweigh the cons because we're scared that something might happen. Like we can just prepare, you know, properly prepare on how to get out of a lift, how to bail a lift properly so that you're not put in a situation where you could get injured. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Thick Thighs Save Lives podcast. I'm Kelsey. Hi, guys. I'm Rachel. Welcome back. Uh, Weird that we both crimped our hair. (laughs) It's a crimping hair kind of day. You know what? It's actually been wicked humid here in Massachusetts, unseasonably warm and humid. And let me tell you guys, we're always we're we're always taking, you know, our photo shoots and stuff like way ahead. So, like, in my mind, it's winter. It's 90 degrees outside. (laughs) Can I ask you a question? Is that two braids, wet hair, gone to bed? Um, No, I used a crimper. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mine's two braids. Yeah, see? That's a good way to do it. Because sometimes you're like, I need to shower and wash my hair. Yeah. I cannot go in my bed mm-hmm. in these conditions. Yeah. And then you do it and then you're like, I can't, I'm, I, that's it. I shaved my legs. <laughs> yeah. I can't put any more into this night. So you're just like, well, I can't blow dry. So I'm just gonna, mm-hmm. that's when I just do two braids and then I just wake up how I wake up and this is. Uh, <laughs> and then I wake up how I wake up. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I do I, have silky smooth legs though. <laughs> See, I go one or two directions with my crimpy hair. It's either that where I'm just like, okay, I'm going to braid it. It's wet. I did the thing. Or I'm on the other side of that where like I straightened it, I curled it. Now it's it's greasy and we need to do something here. <laughs> so we're going to not gonna work. crimp it. Early is not going to work. <laughs> is there something in between? Because it like hides it, so well like, it hides all the dry shampoo. Yeah, like guys, this this is a life hack for you. Second thing about having a hair blow dryer, I haven't had a hair blow dryer since uh, all my stuff left for Florida, and like I don't know. I sometimes I don't know who I am. I don't know who the person was who was packing. She's not me. She didn't think anything. I had my crimper, my curler, my hair straightener. No hair dryer. What? <laughs> what did I think I was gonna do with those things? <laughs> like, <laughs> I did see one time. I don't know if it was real or fake, but I saw this girl. Of course, people were outraged. She says that the best way to straighten your hair is like when it's like wick, like wet. And yeah. she was putting her straining iron like on her wet hair and it was sizzling and steaming. (laughs) I don't know. Like my hair is not a steak. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. I don't think it should be sizzling. (laughs) I don't know. People 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 in the comments were like, no, this is not, this is not it. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to try that. But you did say a hair blow dryer and I was wondering what other kind there would be, but. I don't know. <laughs> Seems like an excessive adjective. <laughs> a hair blow dryer? Yeah. Blow dryer. <laughs> what other kind? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> um, so we both have crimpy hair. You're leaving for Florida. It's it's a vibe. It's a vibe. I do it's... have a really good lifter drop though, and I was wondering if we could do it first. Yeah. Are you prepared. No. Does it matter? No. No. (laughs) Absolutely not. So, well, I don't know if it was a really good lift or drop, but I have been saying that I have wanted to lift meditating for a while. And I've said it in several different ways because I'm looking for like more calmness, like lower my anxiety. And I find it difficult to meditate. I did find this thing about active meditation, and well, I think we should talk about it in the future because I think a lot of people aren't realizing that you can actively modi- uh, meditate. You don't have to sit still for those of us who have some difficulty. <laughs> but, okay, so I've been lifting meditation and being like, it's only 
like 10 minutes, 12 minutes. I use Headspace. But I'm telling you right now, so I've listened to a lot of different podcasts with a lot of like other like entrepreneurs, what I would consider to be successful people, and they all swear by meditation. And these people are extremely busy and they're they're like faking it in and I'm like, okay, I got to do this. So I've been doing it consistently, which I'm super proud of, and I'm finding it life-changing. <gasps> Wow. Yeah, life changing. I find that my anxiety is much lower. I have a better recognition of some of the things that I'm doing on a daily basis that are not serving me and are a little bit toxic. Um, and uh, like the ability to step away from my phone is much easier. And it's definitely making, and I'm not, I'm not just saying this, my brain is functioning better. Yeah, because it's just like it, it. It's almost like clearing out some trash. That's how I'm kind of picturing it right now. It's like mm. it goes through and it just kind of like clears out some trash out of the way and it quiets things down a little bit. And I'm just, I'm I'm a big advocate for it. Wow. Well, I mean, one of the main benefits that I always hear repeated, despite like the type of meditation that you choose is always like a heightened sense of awareness yes is like what it brings and that sounds just like what you're describing just Mm -hmm. like a heightened awareness to what's going on around you and what it you want it to look like and that's cool man yeah I just find that for a lot of people when you feel like you're scrambling a lot of the time or you feel like maybe you're not being successful in some areas, maybe that's your relationship or your job performance or, you know, other avenues, parenting. Um, When we feel like we're scrambling, we tend to scramble more, right? We tend to do these things where it's like, well, I'm not being the best at my job right now. I better research more things. I better spend more time doing things instead of really like clearing out the junk so that we are able to think more clearly and to be able to process information faster and better, more efficient. And it's almost, it's like counterintuitive, right? So we think like, do more, I'll get more, when really like you need to dial it back, clear out some of the noise that's in there, bring your anxiety down so you can think a little bit clearer, make better decisions. And like I'm finding it's just a a game changer. Well, it kind of reminds me of – I remember when I was, I had a, an infant and. <laughs> I um, remember that. It was a traumatic. <laughs> time. God, I don't like to remember it, but. Um, so obviously uh, like the biggest thing was sleep. And I remember thinking in the beginning that I didn't want him to have like too many long naps during the day because like that, then he wouldn't sleep at night. And I remember like a sleep, a sleep, thing that I was reading or a training or something was like sleep begets sleep. So when infants are sleeping a lot, they will sleep a lot. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's like a thing. And then, then the second time I heard that was movement begets movement. So it's like the more you move during the day, it's actually easier to move after. Like people always say like, oh, I'm saving it. I'm saving it for my workout. I don't want to do 20 air squats while I mat the, um, while I'm on my break because I'm saving it for my workout. But like actually it becomes easier to work out and move once you've, when you moved regularly throughout the day. And I think that that's like what you're describing when you say like people, when people are scrambling, they tend to scramble more. It's like mm-hmm. scrambling begets scrambling. <laughs> like it's like whatever you're doing, it's like easier to do that thing. Mm -hmm. So if the thing that you want to be doing is like calm and mindfulness and stuff like that, you have to be practicing that throughout Mm -hmm. the day. It's not like, oh, I'll save this one time for 10 minutes and then I'll be like crazy the rest of the day. Like that's not how that works. You don't, you don't, you don't like keep him awake all day to try to get a big long rest at night. It's that Mm -hmm. didn't work like that, Mm -hmm. which was interesting. Yeah, that's that's a that's a couple of great analogies in there too of like how we see the same pattern repeated and we're like, "Oh, 
that actually makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So that's what you're lifting. Do you want to drop anything or you just wanted to talk about that? I don't mind either way. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes when you have like a life-changing thing you're like I know. does anyone want to hear I about really this life-changing thing I want to yeah. share it with the people because I think so many people look for calmness and mindfulness and in their lives and they like put it out there and say like I want to be more of this and and then don't know what to put into practice to kind of achieve some of those things or they want to say like I would love to be um you know a better decision maker or I would love to um, you know, be better at my job or be a better partner or things like that. But they don't really put things in place because we don't necessarily know which things they are. And it's it's a interesting thing that the answer is just in yourself. Like it's stillness and it's calmness and it's actually just like exiting the rest of the stuff and um, bringing that's, that's calmness cool. to yourself. Well, I just think that's great. And I – are you dropping anything though or are you just um, – I, I, like I said, I'm fine either way. <laughs> I – what am I dropping? Why don't you say yours and I'll think about what I'm dropping. Although that never works out because then I just listen. <laughs> but you, you can might either me. have eye contact <laughs> or you can have me listening. Which one do you want? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um – I I don't know and I <laughs> don't <laughs> I'm going to lift just not knowing and just being okay that. with that. I've said to um well you know I read a lot of like parenting things and I like it's like the importance of like saying I don't know to your mm-hmm. kids or like I did the wrong thing or like apologizing or just being like um, you know, showing the amounts of imperfect um, and being able to like readily admit mistakes. My mistake is I did not plan for a lift or drop today <laughs> and I do not know and um, I'm being unapologetic about that. The end. I, first of all, I really like that because it's always very important our culture is super weird about like I'm sorry's and admitting mistakes and like things like that. But then like women take it all like on the like harsh other end of that where like we're like all we do is make mistakes. I'm so sorry. You walk through a doorway. It's like sorry. Sorry for existing. It's like okay we could find a middle ground here where you could be a parent or a leader or you know a just a regular human and you don't have to, in order to display strength and confidence, you don't have to make zero mistakes. You, It's actually very um, empowering to others to see when you make a mistake, how you act when you make a mistake, because uh, mistakes are inevitable and you don't want to be a know-it-all. Something that I'm dropping is trying to be a know-it-all. I have... I think not that I like necessarily come off to people as a know-it-all, but I think in my mind growing up, I was very much like hiding some of my deficiencies. So I was always very scared that people would uh, find out. (laughs) They would find out like all of my deficiencies or that I was dumb or like, you know, not intelligent. And it was only a matter of time before everyone would figure out that like I couldn't read or like something, something along those lines. So I had this like brewing my entire childhood of like hiding mistakes and trying to let everyone know that I was intelligent, even if I didn't know something. And I think as an adult, um, you know, it's, it, it manifests itself in different ways where like I get nervous if I don't know something and I try and like, fake it until I make it kind of a thing where I, there's nothing to prove. <laughs> there's, there's nothing to prove. <laughs> you don't have to know everything. And it's actually, you know, a, a big sign of intelligence and learning. If you admit that you don't know something and, and then you just listen and it's not a weakness when you don't know something. So I'm kind of dropping this idea of like kind of being a, a know-it-all and, um, like when I don't know something, just listen patiently and not having, trying to not have this fear like wave over me of like everyone knows this and you don't. That's the feeling. 
I wonder if this is like a neurodivergent thing. I would like to hear from more people um, if they like have a like a severe fear of like making mistakes um, or like overcompensating because I see that a lot in Rory. He's just mm-hmm. like a super know-it-all mm-hmm. and I'm like, you don't know everything. And he's like, <laughs> yes, I do. And <laughs> maybe that's just six, but like also I'd be, I'd want it. I, I'd be curious in like a case study on that. Um, so speaking of fear, um, a sad thing happened and we wanted to address it because it is in the fitness community and I think it is a huge fear of a lot of people um, when it comes to like, lifting and one-room axes and stuff like that. And I just feel that the best way to face fear is always like with a head-on and a knowledge approach because um, sometimes... <laughs> oh, you are as a person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, maybe, well, maybe that's just me. Um, no, but I re- I just really feel like so much things, so many things that are, you know, fear based are just um, allowed to sometimes get out of control when we don't um, learn about the thing that we're afraid of. And so I want to talk about this sad story and then I want to talk about why this um, is, did not need to happen. And how we can make sure that people are better prepared to um, feel confident and feel safe lifting heavy in the gym. So there was a very well-known bodybuilder who died a couple weeks ago under a heavy lift. And there is a video floating around. I did not watch it because I don't do stuff like that to myself. Um but he was back squatting. I think it was going to be a PR for him. Um, very, very heavy. I want to like put that out there first of all. Like ninety nine point nine percent of the gym goers that we are, you know, speaking to on a daily basis are no, are nowhere near this heavy. Um, he was trying to back squat four sixty three, dropped the weight onto his neck, and unfortunately, he did die. Um, I think that this like really shook a lot of people in the community because he was like a fitness influencer. He had like a big Instagram, people knew him and um, he was very experienced. He was like a personal trainer, uh, like a diet coach, you know, had this big following. So people kind of thought like he knew it all and like he's young, was, 30. yeah, he's, yeah, he's very young. So um, people were like, well, if it can happen to this guy, um, And so I just wanted to like discuss what the fears are of being under a heavyweight, why a lot of people avoid it, and what are some of the precautions that we can take to make sure that you're never in a compromised position under a heavyweight because this was 100% preventable. This did not need to happen. And I just want to make sure that people have – it's like a safety episode, guys. It's like a – like you are going to get this precursor before you go into the gym so that you can feel knowledgeable and aware of um, how to bail a lift if you ever needed to. And there's like a million reasons to need to bail a lift. Like, honestly, it does not have to be a super heavy weight. I failed like lightweights before. Like one time a bug literally flew into my eye (laughs) in the middle of a jerk. Like it was like, you know, summertime in the gym. And I was like in the middle of a jerk and like a gnat like flew into my eye. And I was like, oh my God, I have to fail this lift. Like it wasn't even heavy. So um, I just feel like there's, um, there's a definite misconception on proper fail technique. And it, it's very important that you know how you how to fail. Yeah. Honestly, I think that somehow in the health and fitness in the fitness industry, um a lot of trainers and a lot of coaches have skipped the um demonstrations or teaching how to properly fail a lift and I just that's such a big mistake. Like, I remember coaching classes. I don't actively coach classes anymore. I remember coaching classes. And during warm-ups, I would have everyone, like, 
if they if they are new especially we're just going to go over how you would get out of this lift and i don't necessarily always call it like failing a lift how how we would fail how we would get out of the lift like if you're not going to complete the lift we need to get out of it and there's just a, a big misconception around spotting and um like needing to have a spotter if you're going to bail or if you have the possibility of bailing. And that's just not true at all either. So one thing that I just want to encourage everyone, whether you are a new lifter or you are an experienced lifter who's maybe never failed before or has never practiced bailing, I really want you to practice bailing out of a lift so that you know what that feels like, what to do. And it's not like we're going to um, bail all the time, but you want to know how to bail and how to bail safely. Yeah, it seems like a weird... It it seems like a weird thing to practice. Um, I remember, you know, being in classes where coaches would have people practice bailing and, like, there would be, like, some, like, laughter and snickering or, like, some confused looks like, why would we do this Um, because it seems like an odd thing to like, wait, we're going to practice not doing it right. (laughs) And it's like, yes, yes, a hundred percent we are. Um, And I just, on the note of spotters, I just want to say during this unfortunate accident, there was a spotter Mm. present. There was two. So I do not want people to be under the impression that a spotter is the be-all, end-all and like I'm safe. This was not just like some every go, everyday gym goer either. Like, oh, hey, buddy, can you can you spot me on 463? Like that, that wasn't the case. This was his coach who is a professional athlete and trainer. So like this is an experienced spotter. It's just that there's too much human error when it comes to relying solely on a spotter. And um, I just think that if people knew how to properly bail, A, they wouldn't feel so reliant on like, well, I need a spotter if I want to go heavy in this lift. No, you don't. And B, there wouldn't be so much pressure on like, well, if I fail this lift and my spotter isn't paying attention or doesn't know exactly what they're doing or like isn't experienced in this, then like something I could get very, very hurt. Like that shouldn't be. You should always be the master of your own ship. Like don't – there's no need to rely on anyone else to keep you safe. Like you keep you safe. You know what I mean? For sure. I think something that's a big misconception around spotters too is – there's a difference between when we're failing a lift and when we're working through a heavy lift. And spotters are particularly helpful when you're working through a heavy lift. So if you need, a, so you're working through a heavy set and you're, you're, I'm talking like fingers are helping you like kind of like lift up the last bit of your bench press because you want to work through that heavy lift where you have made the lift before. Now you're kind of like teetering on if I'm, am I going to make this? I need a little assistance through some sticky points. Like those are good training exercises to start to build some of that muscle and start to build some of that endurance. Like those spotters are great for some of those things. So they're giving you like a little assistance where you're doing 95% of the work and they're helping you through the last bit of the lift. That's a part, that's part of training. But on the flip side of that, when we're going to bailing a lift, they're not helping you work through that lift. We're bailing the lift. We're, we're going in the opposite direction of the weight. We're leaving the weight behind. We're bailing. <laughs> this is The lift is done, right? Like those are two very different um, like ideas when it comes to spotting and when it comes to working through a lift. Yeah. I, it's, it's very important to make sure that those differences are highlighted and to also know that like it's almost impossible to bail a lift with a spotter. So, like, they almost hinder your ability to bail um, because they're literally standing between you and running away (laughs) from the bar. So you're either going to hurt them or you're going to hurt yourself. And a lot of people, you know, um, don't want to purposely hurt someone else and they will take on injury as a result. So it's, like, it's really important to know the difference. I I also want to address the fear for just a second because I think when a lot of people have heard this tragedy and are going to – like, this is why I don't lift. This is why I don't go to the gym. I really don't want you to take that approach because there are – 
injuries, there are freak accidents in everything that we do. And as humans, I mean, you can make this distinction for your own life, but as humans, we're not made to live in this like glass house where nothing is ever going to happen to us and we're not going to chance being healthy and uh, have strong bones and and um, live a healthy lifestyle. Like we're, we're not going to chance that because of the uh, the option because of the idea that we might get hurt like no that's it we don't not do some of the things that we know that the benefits far outweigh that the pros far outweigh the cons because we're scared that you know something might happen like we can just prepare for um you know properly prepare on how to get out of a lift how to bail a lift properly so that you're not put in a situation where you could get injured Want to do another movie quote? Yeah. Well, that's a strange thing to wish. If nothing ever happened to him, then how could anything ever happen to him? I don't know if I said that exactly right. But do you know? Do you know? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Don't say it. Don't, <laughs> don't say it. Well, that's not an exact quote. I'm sorry for the people that are in No, you mad. did it good enough, though. It was good I enough, feel. right? Yeah. Um. Mm-hmm. All right. You get uh one of our new one of our new prints. If you get it, what's the movie? Got to be first. You got to be fast. You gotta be fast. Um, that's a weird thing to to think that you know. Why would you want if nothing ever happens to you? Then nothing's ever gonna happen to you. So you gotta get out there. You gotta do the thing. But you also have to do it knowledgeable so that you are. And and let's be honest. Back squatting four sixty three isn't for the health and longevity of your bones. Okay. I've never had four hundred pounds okay. on my back. It, it's not. The, there is. There are other goals that are there. Okay, that's yeah. not for a oh, yeah, healthy what, lifestyle. No, no, no. Okay, no, no. this is what I'm, I just want to make the distinction. Oh, a hundred percent. There are just like you know, uh, like every other sport um, that people are doing. You know, when we're talking about football players are talking about people who are doing a sport, not for everyday health and longevity. That's obviously not what, um, you know, the goal was there. And there, there are plenty of people who would like to see what the capacity is for the human body and, and would like to push the limits of that. And that is what their goal is in life. And that's awesome. Um, you guys were probably all not one of those. <laughs> we're, we're probably just trying to live a not. lifestyle. So, uh, <laughs> either way, but um, yeah, that is is a is a big differentiator there. Guys, we have to interrupt this episode to just be girlfriends for a second because you don't want to spend a million dollars on costumes that you're not going to use for the rest of the year when we have you covered. You're covered. We have so many different legging patterns that can be implemented into costumes, and then you can also wear them for the rest of the year. We've got vampires, zombies, all kinds of spooky things, serial killers. You can have Sanderson sisters. Sanderson sisters. The witch. I gotta tell you, the witch costume on point this year. But we have you absolutely covered so that you can be comfy cozy this Halloween. Nothing worse than a scratchy ass Halloween costume that's True. drop shipped and horrible quality. So instead, come to Constantly Varied Gear and get some cute ass leggings for the Halloween season. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of the most common lifts and we're going to talk to you about how to bail them properly and in a way that will keep you safe, other gym goers safe, and um, most importantly, give you confidence to be able to push your boundaries a little bit without, you know, uh, feeling that you're in danger or unprepared. Um, So before we go into the exercises themselves and how to bail out, I just want to mention a couple of things. First of all, we are not talking about how to bail out when you're on a Smith machine. You shouldn't be squatting in a Smith machine ever, not today, not tomorrow. It's a coat rack. Please don't use it for anything. Um, so none of these things that we're going to talk about apply to the Smith machine. So just, if you want to talk about that, go back to the episode that we did on why you do not squat in a Smith machine. Number two, everything we're going to talk about is using bumper plates. Okay. If you do not have access to bumper plates, my general rule of thumb is you should not be one rep max attempts, um, unless you are in 
a situation where you're in a squat rack with safety bars. Like there's no reason. Or you're prepared to break those weights. <laughs> <laughs> or the floor. <laughs> there's no Whatever. reason that you shouldn't be using bumper plates. Like most of the gyms now have come around to the fact that like bumper plates are safer. They are more effective. Like it just we're not talking about metal weights when we're talking about bell and lifts. Um, and thirdly, we need – that's not a word – we need to be squatting in a squat rack, okay? If if you're not squatting in a squat rack with safety bars, like you right off the bat, you're just not as safe as you could be, um, especially if you're alone or in a small space, a smaller like you you're in your garage, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Um, and lastly, is that I want this is like a real weird thing that I have to say again because like it's like. I still see people doing this um, at the gym and online. You need to be backing out of the rack, never walking forward out of the rack, right? So like I know that this is like a common thing for for new gym goers is they kind of think that you start in the rack and you walk it out into the open space. That's not actually the way that you lift anything from a rack. You want to make sure for your own safety you are starting – like literally facing the rack and then you're walking the weight backwards. I know that seems weird, but that's the way we do it in order to keep you safe. So those are the precursors to all of our safety talks when it comes to the specific exercises. I think the the thing with that with some new people is that um, you think it, you, you need to be in the squat rack. So a lot of the squat racks at like um, Globo Gyms are – your typical gyms they're set up like a box and then a lot of people think you need to go inside because you're going to use the machine so you go inside and then you have the bar which is obviously on the j-hooks and then you walk it out when it's 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 just the opposite of that like you're ultimately like more than likely you're going to be facing the wall or a mirror that's where it's usually set up and then and you're looking at that the wall of the mirror the the majority of the gym is behind you and you just back it out Back it out. Back it out, girl. You, you know, you see where the J-hook, the J-hooks are on on the rig or the bar at every point, you, and you know that's the only way you can get the bar out. So just know every time you're looking at that, if, if you're brand new to the gym, that you're always going to be stepping back from those. Yes, and when you're re-racking it, you're always going to be stepping walking forward, forward. Yeah. right? We're never re-racking walking backwards, like trying to find the J-hooks without – having them in our site. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, little things that, um, you know, could help somebody. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the back. Also, if you ever, guys, be a friend, be a girlfriend. If you're ever at the gym and you might see someone who doesn't know that and they're, you know, kind of just trying to figure it out, like go over and just uh, help them, assist them out. Like, let them know, let a girl know. (laughs) if she's got broccoli in her teeth you know what I mean like let somebody know like oh actually like in a really you know friendly way actually you might want to you know just back out this way yeah and it's always good to precursor it with like a safety thing hey it's way way safer I used to do that too when I first started um Mm -hmm. and then someone told me it's it's really there's some dangers in doing that yeah um and you know I just don't want to see you get hurt like stuff like that will Mm -hmm. will always go over really well um Okay, so let's start with the back squat. How are we getting out of a back squat that there is no way we're standing up? Okay, so the bar is on your back, so the bar is going back and you're going forward. (laughs) That's exactly what I want you to do. So you're ultimately going to toss the bar in the direction that it's already going, and that's going to be the overall theme for every one of the movements where the momentum of the bar is going, you're never changing the direction of the momentum of the bar. You're in a failing or you're in a bailing position, right? So you, the momentum with the bar is going in one direction and you, your body is going in the other direction. So if you're back squatting, the bar is already on your back. I never want to see someone fail a back squat by throwing the bar over their head. Oh god. This is counterintuitive anyway. It's like the but but the thing is it's like the bar is not going in the direction. It's already sitting on your back. So what you're going to do is shrug your shoulders up, toss the bar back and you're going to either step forward or go forward to your knees. If you're in the bo- if you're in like the very bottom of the squat, you know, usually sh- can be usually are able to just 
toss it back and step forward. Um, but if you're in the very bottom and you're tossing it back and you're just kind of like you're diving forward onto your knees, it's not weird. It's not weird. <laughs> it's not weird. A lot of people think like this is going to be like they realize it in the moment. And I'm going to just tell you, there is no embarrassment to failing a squat. There's no embarrassment to failing any lift that you're doing when you're doing it safely. No one, it, yeah, it might make a, a crash. You might be like, oh, I really didn't want to do that. Like, it doesn't matter. We're all there. We, we've all seen a, a failed squat before or a failed push press. And like, no one, no one cares. Probably people are going to come over and be like, do you want me to help you re-rack it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> seriously. Been there. Like, yeah. can I help you and, you know, get it back up there? Yeah, seriously. Because like, I think it, it becomes like a big thing in your mind. Um, yeah. But really, everybody's been there. Yes. And you're right. This is going to be – all of these are going to be the quickest breakup you ever had. You're going one way. The bar is going the other way. Whatever way the bar is going, you're going the opposite way. If you see the bar on the street, you literally turn a corner, run the other direction. It's like the worst X ever. So mm. just like kind of think of that. And I think that's another – you know, and we're going to talk about with all these lifts of why the importance of actually failing it. Because when you hear it, you're like, okay, so if I'm in the rock bottom, I'm in the way bottom, I cannot stand back up. I'm going to roll the bar back and I'm going to like slide forward onto my knees. Like what? Am I, what? But if you practice it, you realize it actually feels pretty natural yeah. when you, when you're going to do it. And you also practice it because you want to make sure that you have the mobility to do that. Mm -hmm. If you don't, then we need to talk about like just gaining mobility before we are adding load. Um, the front squat. And you can be... practice this with a PVC pipe. That's Oh, I was going to say that if you, if you're like, well, I'm not going to, I already don't want to make a loud crashing noise. Now you want me to practice it like mm. with lightweight. You can practice it with a broomstick. Mm. You can practice it with anything. You can practice it with things that don't make a loud crashing sound just so that you can make sure that you've built that muscle memory. Um, all right, the front squat. How are we bailing the front squat? First of all, make sure that you're leaving room between you and the rack when you walk out a front squat, okay? one, one and a half steps. That's plenty. You don't need to like back up to, you know, the other side of the gym. Um, yeah. But you but don't. But you should be at least a minimum one, one full step away. One full step, like your full step, not like a foot. I mean like a full, you know, you're opening up and stepping back. Um, only because this one, you're going to, the bar's going to fail in front of you. And if you're all hugged up on the rig, then you're going to have nowhere, or the, the rack, you're going to have nowhere to dump the bar forward without it like hitting the, the rack and then hitting back at you. So you just want to have plenty of room. That's all. Yeah. I think it also gives you that like second pause that you don't need about like not failing it because you're too close to the rack. It's going to hit the rack, like whatever. You don't need that extra second you need worrying that about where the bar is going next because in the moment what you are worried about is the bar going in one direction and you're going in another direction so the bar is already in the is already in front of you so it's going in front of you you're dumping it in front of you and you're going backwards you guys are going in opposite directions yeah and you might just like with the back squat if you're in the rock bottom you might land on your bum yeah and that's okay that's okay as long as the bar has gone the other way and you've fallen backwards. Um, however you land is how you land, but as long as you two are parting ways as fast as possible, that's what we're looking for. Um, as far as overhead presses, this is kind of a weird one because it depends on why and how you're failing this lift. Sometimes when you're failing an overhead press, or, or the, the bar overhead in any way. It's because you haven't achieved full lockout and the bar is way out in front of you. So like in that case, you would just dump forward because it's already not made it over your head. It's already like hovering around your forehead area and it's not going to get locked out. So it goes forward, you go backwards, you part ways. Most likely in that case, you'll probably stay on your feet because um, it's, you know, it's overhead, but like, that's why it depends. And the other case, it might be that 
you have pressed the bar overhead, but you have not gotten in a receiving position with your lower body that is correct or stable or like a good stance. And so the bar is like pressed out overhead. It's like over the crown of your head, but you're not stable in the bottom. So you have to dump it. Then in that case, it's kind of already going backwards. So it goes back, you go forward. Yeah. If you've noticed anything about what Rachel says, it's that you're following the momentum of the bar. If you've already started pushing it out in front of you and that's why you're going to fail the lift, you're going to continue pushing it out in front of you and go the other way. If you're pushing the bar behind you and your body is ultimately, if you're pushing the bar behind you, the momentum's going back and your body is trying to get under it, which is moving forward, then the bar is already headed in a back position. You're already headed in a forward position. You, Everyone keeps going their, their same ways. Keep going your same ways. If it needs to part, then just go the direction you're already going and let the bar go the direction it was already going. Um, And last but not least is the bench press. I think that this is definitely – I would say this and the back squat are the two that people are most afraid of when it comes to failing because, like, the bar on your back is like, oh, boy (laughs) – Oh, and the bar above your chest is like, okay, these are like I'm going to get crushed kind of situations. And that's why I think we see a lot of women especially shying away from bench press altogether Mm. and just being like, that's just too scary. Um, And I just want to say that there are so many ways to do this safely. There's no reason whatsoever that you should be afraid of this exercise or going heavy in this exercise. You just need to know these couple things. That's all. Um, First thing is do not ever put collars or clips or whatever safety, whatever you call them at your gym. Don't put safety clips on your bar when you're benching. They should never be on your bar. Mm -hmm. We're not holding. Am I boring you? Yep. <laughs> I know it's like a safety class, and you're like, listen, everyone, do this or you die. And then people are like, well, geez, are you sure? I, I, um, <laughs> I just, it's like, sex, like, it's like sex said, like, well, the first time you have sex, you're going to get pregnant. <laughs> like, I know. If you if you put collars on your bar, you are <laughs> going to get crushed. Like, oh god. It's like calm down, lady. <laughs> Jeez. Maybe you should do the bench. <laughs> I mean, here's what I want to say first and foremost about bench. Is that bench is actually the in my personal opinion, the only place that I enjoy having a spotter and um, I think is the most beneficial place to have a spotter is when you're bench pressing. So if you have the ability to have a spotter when you're benching, that's fantastic. But the what Rachel was getting at, the reason why you don't have collars on your bar is if you do need to bail, you're bailing to the side so that the weight can just slip off. So picture it, right? Like you have the bar locked out or on its way to a lockout um, above your chest and you're not going to make it, it probably is going to come back down and you're just going to lean to the side and let the weight come off of it. So it comes off completely on one side of the bar and then it's going to come off on the other side of the bar because you don't have any collars holding it on so that you have the ability to get the weight off of the bar while you're still under it. Now, Make sure you say help to help. <laughs> whenever I've had to slide the weight off the bar for a bench. Yeah. When when you go to turn it to slide, just make sure you say like in a small voice, help. <laughs> so you get the full effect. You got to get the full effect. It's yeah. very true. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of the only one where it's not like a, your body is going in one direction. The momentum of the bar is going in the other one. That's why it's a little bit more of a difficult fail. Um, So I just want to give an alternative for people when it comes to bench pressing and the benefits of bench pressing. If you are doing them alone and that sounds like weird and scary, just use dumbbells because like 
you, you, you won't have to worry about slipping off the weight. When you have two dumbbells that are operating independently, you then just let them go to the side. So failing when it comes to uh, a bench press, when uh, you have the bar, you can't just like break the bar in half and let it go on either direction. But if you are by yourself and you're a little bit worried about that, you can use some dumbbells and ultimately like you just let the dumbbells go off to the side because you're not moving when you're in a bench press. Your body can't go in any other direction. And you can always like let the weight go. Like damaging the weight is not damaging your body. We're not worried about those <laughs> no. ultimately. And if you have good um, – dumbbells or bumpers anyway they're made for that they're made to be dropped I remember when people started getting used to bumpers like they they didn't realize how much they were just made to be dropped and everyone's like what why are you dropping the weights it's like because that's what they're made for (laughs) and like thank god because why in the world were we making weights out of metal (laughs) <laughs> I don't know, like stone. That's We're just like, like chiseling them. <laughs> Come on, it's 2023. Like cars are going to start driving themselves. And we have like giant pieces of metal that we lift. And if we drop them, they make crashing noises. Like yeah. why? No. Destruction. That's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Um, yeah, so dumbbell bench is such a great option. And I'm so glad you said it. And also like, you know, probably it's just going to be lefty. Right, mm. you're gonna be pressing up. Righty's gonna be all the way up, and you're gonna yeah. be like, you're like "Come ah. on, lefty, <laughs> damn it! You just drop that one." <laughs> um, the other option, obviously, is like I want to make sure that people are using safeties um, when they bench because if you are, if you do have a bar, even if you have a spotter, you should have the safeties on. Um, and a lot of people don't have their safety set at the right height. Mm. so like they're coming down for their bench and they don't have full range of motion because like hitting the safeties or the safeties are like way too low so that when if they do fail they're like stuck under there and (laughs) (laughs) like um yeah so just just push position them right at your chest not like at your neck right Mm. that's too low and not anywhere above that's too high um but just make sure that you like do a test run when you position them and like with just an empty bar, like just like let it go onto the safeties and see how far it goes down. Like can you still wiggle out of there if you mm-hmm. needed to? Um, so if you have the option, spotter or bail, I would always bail 100% of the time. I just think it's way, way too much human error to be relying on someone else when you're under a heavy load. Plus, like, just weird stuff happens. Like, one time there was, like, a uh, – I heard about a lady who was, like, passed out in the middle of a lift. Like, a spotter's not going to save you. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's just – it's so much better if you can to work with bumpers and just toss it off so that you can, you know, um, not rely on anyone. And how often should you practice failing, Kelsey? Um, if you're a beginner. If you're a beginner – you should practice bailing before you lift, before yes. you actually practice lifting. Like you should know how to get out of your lift um, in in every one of your lifts too. So like just because you practice bailing out of a back squat, like doesn't mean that you have practiced failing out of a jerk or an overhead press or like anything that you're doing overhead. Like just make sure that you're practicing the different movements because you might learn something about how you move and what your initial reaction wants to be and you can kind of correct it before you get into that position yeah as I've, you're more of an ex- oh go ahead no I just wanted to say like every like if you're a beginner and you're setting up to back squat like you're failing you're practicing uh, I know you said you don't want to call it failing you're practicing <laughs> bailing a back squat if mm-hmm. you're a beginner and you're setting up for overhead presses and, and like you said you can just do it with a pvc pipe so you don't you're not yeah. all noisy and um yeah God forbid we be noisy women. Oh, Quiet down. <laughs> Quiet down. Be good. Don't make a lot of noise or true, a big true. production. If you are more of an experienced lifter, you don't need to practice bailing often. Um, you, if because it of just happens. <laughs> lifter, you you bail. You know, and you have done it and you're like, oh, it's going to be one of those days. Um, So you really don't need to. Maybe I should just say that when I fail a lift. Oh, I was just practicing. I was just practicing. I was just practicing failing. I haven't done it in a while, so. I do want to say as a caveat to that, 
just because I've seen this happen. I knew an experienced lifter who, she lifted heavy, she had a heavy back squat, and for some reason, her react, her initial reaction to wanting to, when she was going to bail, was to be to throw the weight over her head, and I was like, girl, so if you know that you're that person, I just suggest to you, then you, you people listening, you know who you are. <laughs> the over then the head you, people? Yeah. Like, you know that you might need to practice a little bit more, but for everybody else, um, you don't need to, and you're an experienced lifter, you don't need to practice often yeah. failing. Yeah. It'll just happen. <laughs> yeah. It'll just happen. Um, and, you know, lastly, this is just muscle memory, just like everything else, right? So, like... After a couple practice runs, your body is going to remember how you fail, and then you're not going to need to think about it anymore. But I just want to say, if you're constantly failing the lift, it's too heavy, okay? Yeah. It's too heavy. You should not be constantly failing anything. Listen, if you don't max out every day. No. No. Not only that, but like – even if you're testing a one rep max, you're not trying a weight you failed like four or five different times. No, not appropriate. You haven't hit that weight for a reason. Like if, you know, some a bug flew in your eye and you're like, okay, I know what the reason was. I can hit that weight. Well, that's one thing. But we're not failing a lift multiple times. This is an emergency situation and it should be rare. It shouldn't be like you know, you're failing like three times a week. Like that's, that's not it. And, um, I just, it, not only is it a confidence killer to constantly be dumping a bar, but also whatever is making you need to bail that lift, something mechanically is yeah. going wrong. If you continue to just do that over and over, your muscle memory is working in the wrong direction. You're practicing a bad technique. So that's why I'm saying like if something is breaking down to the point where you need to bail, you need to back off the weight and figure out what the technique problem is and then fix it. And then you can move yourself back up. It's fine. Mm. But it shouldn't be like – I just don't want people to think like we're just walking into the gym failing every day. Like that's – it's or bailing every day. It's not what we're doing. No, absolutely not. And, and you can look at like what is happening that might be inappropriate before that's happening. So it's either you're making jumps that are too big. So if you are hitting a weight consistently before that and you keep making 10 pound jumps after that, you need to be making five pound jumps, like hit something consistently just before that, that builds the confidence so that when you make your next jump, you don't, you don't know, like every time I get to 250, I just, I, I bail. Like you don't, you don't want that in your head. I hit 245 consistently. Um, you know, I've hit it for five weeks in a row. Maybe I'm going to go for 250, but you're not, you're not maxing out every day. It's not appropriate. Um, you don't want to practice bailing all the time. And I think this is like women tend to not get to a max. Like you need to tell men they can't max out every day. Right. You don't really have to tell women no. that. No. Like, they don't want to no. quite as much. Um, so so on the flip side of that, don't be afraid to go heavy. Don't be afraid to, afraid to push, you know, where your limits are and find out where that spot is in an appropriate way. And then once you get to a weight where you know that is your max and you have failed the lift because that is your max, my suggestion to you is – that day before you, so you're done lifting, I found my max, whatever it was. You want to hit that lift, take the, take the weight off, take a bunch of weight off to a light weight, hit that lift, a, a successful lift before you clean up for the day. Because you always, this might be just a mental thing for me, I always want to end on a successful lift for my body and for my mind. <laughs> like I don't want the last thing that my brain and my body remembers from that training session to be an unsuccessful lift. Yeah, because when you replay an unsuccessful lift in your mind, yeah. your body actually fires the muscles responsible for that. And it's almost like you're learning it <laughs> over and over. So yeah, the the kinds of lifts you want to be replaying in your mind are your good ones. Mm -hmm. So um, that's so true. Well, you guys, not to scare you that if you – the first time you have sex, you're going to get pregnant. But 
Um, you are going to eventually, if you lift for long enough, you are going to need to bail out of a lift. And the best possible thing that you can arm yourself with is practice and knowledge so that you can do it successfully and safely and never feel like you'd be compromised in any way. So we hope that this has helped with giving you some more confidence. I think it absolutely will. And don't, you know, don't be afraid. We're not, we're not living... The ships are safe in the harbor, but that's not what, me- what ships are meant to do. You know, we're out here living our best lives, and that involves taking care of your body and lifting things and learning new things and no limits with your body. So don't be afraid of those, but also prepare um, in the best way possible. Like we wear our seatbelts. We know how to <laughs> we know how to fail out of a lift. That doesn't mean stop driving a car. Like these are just things to know. So hopefully this was very helpful for you. Um, and have a great week at the gym and in life. We love you guys.